The tiny village of Fisherton Delamere lies just downstream of the two-mile Wiley fishery that I've looked after since 1957. And June, for me, is weed-cutting time, that very thirsty time of the year, when I'm glad to start the day by tethering a bottle of my homemade wine in the Fisherton Mill stream. Because for 14 days, every June, I go down to Fisherton Delamere, park my car, and work hard all day, tending the fishery, cutting the weed, making it absolutely right for the fishermen. A young robin watching me is spotted breast, betraying his age, and the martins collecting mud at the water's edge for their nests in the old mill itself. And from this bridge beside the old mill, I normally start my day, having put on my long and very hot waders, and got out my scythe, blunted traps from the previous day's labour. This weed cutting is an essential task in midsummer each year, at least on this river. There are various reasons why it has to be undertaken, some purely functional, some purely aesthetic. For one thing, if you didn't cut the weed, there'd be a tendency of the river level to uh, go too high for the banks to be eroded by overflow. And for another thing, if you didn't open up some of the weed, it'd be very difficult for fishermen to put a fly on the water. And so there is a combination of reasons. Round about June the 10th I begin as a rule and I carry on until June the 24th when by a sort of gentleman's agreement in Wiltshire we try and stop weed cutting and allow the river to settle down once again. And when you go out on a June day, a long day that very often starts as early as 7 in the morning and may not finish until close on dark, there are so many things to captivate you and to interest you that at times it's difficult to really get on with the work. You may recognize the damselfly there. It's one of the most beautiful to be seen on our chalk streams at this midsummer period. The black band on the wings of this male tells you it is the banded agrium. So much different in color, the blue male, to the rather drab and uh, greenish female with her clear wings. Brightly coloured too are the many different snails that you find in the water herbage along the river bank itself. Herbage which I shall have to trim off before this job of weed cutting is finally completed. And there are snails in the water too. Snails, if you have time to study them, are a fascinating subject. Today, I'm afraid, we've no time for such things. We must get on with the job in hand. June is a flower deck month. Largely a white month in my experience. White butterflies, white elder blossom on the hedgerows, white moon daisies among the long grasses and the small daisies on the unkept lawns if you leave them for a day or two at this time of the year. And everywhere the wild rose binds its garland on the lovely brow of May. In the water itself, the white flowers of the water buttercup, the ranunculus, which is the weed I'm mostly concerned with in this fishery management business. And this ranunculus is eaten by, among other things, swans and their cygnets. I'm not fond of swans as a fisherman. I have many reasons for disliking them. They make a mess on the river bank. I'm afraid they very often disturb the fish on a fishing day. But who can deny they make a charming picture here on the river in the lovely warm sunshine of a June morning. On a blazing June day, there's something very cool about the water pouring in through these boiling hatch pools. And everywhere throughout the length of the fishery, the mallard have their ducklings, varying in size from literally just out of the egg to birds plump enough to be suggestive already of the green peas fattening in my garden. The charming companion I see so much of every day, the water vole, is a harmless creature. He makes holes in the bank, it's true, but he's very much a vegetarian and in no way related to the rat with which he's often confused. The water vole, not a water rat. Some of the ducks have been thinned out, I'm afraid, by the odd feral mink which have already strayed into the Wiley Valley. Water voles don't see very well, but when you get really close to them, once they can focus and decide you are there, they'll take off and move very swiftly indeed. A 
the noise of the river is a very pleasant accompaniment to weed cutting because make no mistake about it this really is laborious business and from time to time one can envy the young fishermen finding something perhaps rather more interesting at the water side A little sadly, I must confess, it's time we broke this spell and got down to the rather more prosaic business of actually cutting the weed. The thick ranunculus tresses, which already cover the river almost from bank to bank. And let no one be in any doubt that this weed cutting job really is hard labour. And in these hot chest waders which are essential when the water very often runs right up almost to within an inch of the top it's very warm work indeed and the shorn ranunculus tresses drift away in the bright june sunshine and themselves make interesting patterns on the water surface and where i've revealed them a shoal of immature minnows playing on the golden gravel and a caddis its case composed of quite heavy gravel particles which of course help to tether it so to speak in the fast current from these caddis scrubs the sedge flies come that haunt the midsummer nights and a pair of shrimps one carrying the other swift movers and the ugly squat black nymph of the beautiful yellow may dun my sunglasses help me to see into the depths and now a really big crayfish has been exposed and is seeking for shelter, a creature of the night, a scavenger. And this is a really big adult for this river, something like six inches long and capable of giving you a really sharp nip with those big lobster pincers. A fearsome creature to behold in close-up. Tiny sedge warbler with a beak full of food. Her nest is just in the sedges at the water's edge where in the shade a frog takes his ease and regards me with a seemingly malevolent stare glaring to the burning midsummer sun beating down on the water and that's why I wear these sunglasses when I'm weed cutting I'd never dream of wearing them when I'm fishing I don't like the advantage it gives me to being able to see in the water I'd rather take fish on on their own terms. That's a purely personal feeling. I never tell other people they should think like that. And already the weed bars begin to take shape at the far end of the reach. It's a very satisfying thing to tend a river, as I've tended this one these eight years past, and to see it taking shape at weed cutting time and looking so nice for the fishermen whom I try to serve. A river really is in some ways like a garden, or you wouldn't think so to see this uncut reach where the martins dip and the swallows play, and the moorhens search among the watercress for their food. A little white tail flickering. Well, my labour for the day having ended, I thought it would be tremendous fun to try and catch a trout for my supper and spotting quite a good fish, because the trout on this part of the Wiley don't run big, a pound is exceptional, three quarters of a pound, a good fish. Spotting a trout, I thought I'd have him out. He wasn't rising, but I'd no doubt a little nymph would do the trick. A bear hook with just a bit of wire on it to make it sink. The problem is, of course, to put the nymph precisely in front of the trout so that I can just lift it in the water and make him take. The famous induced take of the nymph fisherman. Let's try it now. As the nymph drifts down at the fish's level, just lift it in front of him. There it is. He's on. Straight away, he runs hard for the ranunculus upstream. We hold him back and we turn him and a lot of the steam goes out of him in that first unsuccessful rush. Get the net under him quickly before he starts to go again. I don't want to hang about here pandering to fish at this time of an evening. Beautifully spotted trout of the wily. All wild fish, there's no artificial stocking in these parts. No rainbows, nothing, just the trout.
We don't even get pike up in this water. A few grayling, that's all. And now the tiny nymph on which the fish was taken lowered it down there in salute. One's enough for any man for his supper. And what I like to do to accompany that trout is to find myself a wild salad at the waterside, a few sprigs of watercress. There, some beautiful ragged robin. Passing now, a lovely wild orchis. These wild orchis abound in this water meadow. And at last, some dandelion leaves that make a succulent salad. You just carry a bit of salt in the boot of your car, something to cook a fish in, and you've got a meal there to remember for the rest of your days. What time is it? High time. High time for supper. And that tiny little stove enables me to cook a trout in no time at all with a minimum of fuss. Put out the stove, settle down on the cushion, pneumatic cushion given me by my Danish friends when I fished over there in Jutland last year, and start my supper. And believe me, at this time, seven o'clock in the evening, having been on the job for 12 hours, I feel I've earned it. I almost forgot that cooled wine which I'd taken from the mill stream a moment or two before. Let's open it now. Sparkling elderflower wine. Kite's champagne. And so to end yet another June day, a day of labour and beauty and fun.